You're listening to the Straight to Video Podcast with Rob Lane. What is up? How you doing? And thank you for listening to my show, Straight to Video. We've got some slick 90s pop vibes on today's show as I check in with singer-songwriter Pete Cunner from the band D-Ream, whose hit single Things Can Only Get Better is without doubt one of the biggest and most iconic chart-topping hits of that decade and is still a huge smash to this day whenever it gets played. One of those timeless songs that can time travel you back to a specific time or place. And mine was probably Tonka's Nightclub in Ripley one Saturday night shortly before me and my mates will be heading for a kebab and the last bus home. It's always a treat for me to chat with people like Pete and hear their story and background. Pete in particular was super cool because as Dream are associated with pop, soul, house music and R&B influences, Pete's story begins very much in rock and roll and his childhood in Derry, Northern Highland, where as a young guitarist he would first tread the boards with his band Ty the Boy, earning Radio 1 sessions and almost landing a record deal with U2's Mother Records. Following the breakup of that band, Pete would find himself in London and a house music scene which totally fueled his creative musical juices and would see him hook up with his D-Ream songwriting partner Alan McKenzie, which would begin a path to the very top of the UK charts with several hit singles. D-Ream continue to write and release music to this day and currently have a brand new single, I Used to Believe in Love, out on October the 15th from their latest album, Open Hearts, Open Minds. And for all the info you need on the band, you can find them at d-ream.co.uk. Before I chat, please grab yourself some Dead School Coffee over at deadschoolcoffee.co.uk where you can get 15% off your purchase by entering the promo code STV on checkout when filling up on some of their amazing ground or full bean coffee from the UK's best independent rock and roll coffee company. Love those guys and glad to have them supporting this show. Also want to shout out to our newest patron on the Straight to Video Patreon page. So welcome on board, Rob Selby. Really appreciate your support, mate, and thanks for being part of the growing community we're creating over there. If you too would like to get behind-the-scenes access to this podcast, along with a bonus movie show, guest announcements, and exclusive merch, then it can all be found over at patreon.com forward slash stvpod, and I would love to have you on board. All right, Pete was really cool to talk to, a lovely bloke, and I think it'll be very obvious early on what a fan of music he is. It's pretty clear to this day he still lives and breathes it and is part of who he is and is still so passionate about creating. So if this might seem like a bit of a curveball left field guest compared to the hard rock stuff I usually have on, I'm sure you'll soon realise we're all pretty much the same when it comes to music. Whatever the style it is, it gets in your blood and once it's there then it never leaves. So sit back and enjoy my straight to video chat with Dereem's Pete Cunner. I used to believe in love. I'm just checking out what you've got in the back. So you're a bass player, right? That's right. Yeah, good spot. Yeah, what have you got there? Well, I've got my um, Fender Jazz bass. That's my go-to, which I've had for yeah. like over 20 years. And then I've, I've got this Italia Torino bass, which I'm a big fan of um, Stuart Sutcliffe from the Beatles, their original bass player. Really? Yeah, he's the coolest guy ever. But I looked into it quite a bit because I've got a Fender Music Man. I play oh, bass nice. too. So sometimes you just a synth just won't cut it. You just have to have all this kind of... Lovely little accidents and frills that you get from jamming it. They call it a girl's bass, you know, because it's a short neck. I still go to the jazz. It's my go-to for playing and recording. It's just so versatile. It's great. I love it. Yeah, well, it's it's the disco. That's the sound of disco, that bass and everything else. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you ever so much for doing this. Much appreciated. The theme of the podcast just follows people's journey a little bit from the beginning to what kind of put them on the path to what they're known for and all that kind of thing. So if it's all right just to throw things back a little bit and... Um, talk about your journey from Ireland to London and all that kind of thing. Yeah, no problem. So you're from Derry in Northern Ireland. Growing up during the 70s, what was that time like for you as a kid? Because obviously there's a lot of political stuff going on. Was that something you was aware of or just kind of got on with it? Very much so. Um, as a child, I mean, I was born in 66. So I was born at the time of a thing that we call the civil rights movement, which was when the Catholics that lived here, the Protestants were running this show 
And they kind of treated the Catholics as second-class citizens. So they were inspired by Dr. Martin Luther King's civil rights movement. Passive, you know, the, I suppose when Gandhi started it, and then Martin Luther King picked up on it. And, you know, when he had his We Have a Dream, and then we have um, we had our own Martin Luther King here who headed that up. Now what's his name? I can't he, He's a politician. Everyone rallied behind him, and that, that was the 60s. I, I, all I remember as a child was stay away from the window because during riots it could be either a bullet or a stone. So very similar in many ways to the, the occupation of Palestine by the Israelis in that we, we, we were growing up in a police state, basically. So I was just aware of guns and bullets. And But, I mean, from a child's point of view, I had an action man. You know, those uh, someone called it a doll when I was in my 20s, and I got really offended because it was it's not a doll, it's action man, Right. It's actually he's got a gun, you know. My action man's AK-47 or whatever it was, the, the rifle that he had with the magazine was very accurate. And I went up to one of these soldiers. He must have been 17. I mean, very young. But he pulled out the magazine and showed me the real bullets. And all us kids were like gathering around going, wow, that's so cool. That's so really cool. Wow. That's he's such real a life. weird... Isn't it? Isn't that a weird idea? So you kind of grow up with this thing. But, you know, there was bands like Stiff Little Fingers who were very much politicized. They were alternative Ulster and, and that kind of thing. But... When we were just jamming, when we started jamming, we were like, I started my first band when I was about, I think the first one was in our mom's kitchen. I was 10 and we couldn't play a bloody thing. We took the bass in and we turned it upside down and put a towel over it and had drumsticks, you know, for the snare, that kind of thing. And we were just jamming away. I'd learned the lick from um, Message in a Bottle by Police. So I had this lovely little six string Framus, a semi-acoustic, just acoustic, and it had F holes on it. And so it made enough of a noise and we put this thing together and someone had a bass. So that was, that was the start of it, you know, and then our drummer dropped out within six months because he just wasn't feeling it. He wasn't dedicated enough. And it was, that was my first experience. Only 10, you know. Who was your kind of like your blueprint then? Was you listening to stuff like The Police and just rock bands of the time? I was absolutely obsessed by The Police because I didn't realise how, I mean, I found out later that The Police were so good as musicians. They made a pact with each other to see how they could deliver the song with the least amount of notes and the least amount of playing. So when you hear like Bring On The Night, he just does a, a one note lead break, right? That's what he does. But he plays the hell out of that note and, and keeps it interesting and go and listen to it. And I, you know, I was fascinated by stuff like this. You know, learn an awful lot by emulating your heroes. And if you listen to, I was listening to um, Johnny Marr and I was into people like Chet Atkins. So I was learning to pick on the guitar. So my riffs were more developed, you know, than, than most of the other kids. And um, I didn't really have a tutor as per se. I just picked up bits and pieces from, from other guys. There wasn't any formal education. I pretty much taught myself. But I was listening to, you know, the Smiths, Eurythmics, the Police, U2. In fact, our first gig, we were called Legion to start with, but then we changed later to Tie the Boy. And I was 15 and it was a college social and there was 500 boys and girls from the various sort of posh schools that we have here. And they were all dressed up in, you know, bow ties and evening dresses, their prom dresses, basically. I was reminiscing the other day with our drummer. He had a fantastic sparkling red Gretsch kit. And our bass player had, um, I think he had a Music Man bass. The lead singer had a, what's his guitar now? It was an Aria Pro. I had a Fender, um, not Music Master. What do you call the, what do you call the one Kurt Cobain played? That one. Our set this was like, and Cat Do by U2. We had um, Ziggy Stardust, The Spiders From Mars. We had Should I Stay or Should I Go by The Clash. And we had three or four of our own. And we played for, for half an hour. And people were dancing. And that was my first real experience of, of playing live. That must feel good when you get that reaction from the crowd that first time. Yeah, well, we put enough covers to get them on side. And then they stayed dancing for our stuff. It's just magic. I mean, instead of running around outside throwing stones at the police, I was sitting inside learning frames on my guitar and dreaming of girls in glory in the shadow of a war, you know? <laughs> did you all know each other? Was you all like school friends or did you join that band? For any of you listeners, anyone's interested, I've sort of had a good think about this now that I'm in my mid-50s and I went through that period. You've got a window when you're 15 to when you're about 21. So you've got those four or five years where you've got to make it work. Because when you hit 21... All your friends and your bandmates are like, they're going to get real. So they're going to get mortgages. They're going to have kids. And then the pressure's on, right? And so you're the last man standing. I was standing there going, everyone's leaving the ship. What do I do? So I kind of red-pilled myself out of the education system. And I made a deal with the devil that I'd just stay doing what I wanted to do for the rest of my days, no matter if I was poor or rich. I was just going to live on nothing and just learn music because I was obsessed with music. I shit, eat, and breathe music. And I just... That's all I do. Right. So I went from being in an indie band where 
we were kind of, you know, four, four guys making that sound and a very limited sound you can make when you don't know much about layering and you don't know much about overdubbing to getting my first Atari uh, S950. I had an RX, a Yamaha RX5 and I programmed the shit out of these things and I pulled, started pulling noises out of these things that I couldn't necessarily do with guitar. And then I had a Kramer locking sync, which I took my eight tracks stuck it together with that and I was running vocals and guitars and um, keyboards all over this stuff and began building up a sound and I got a reputation for being able to do this and I started getting studio work. Was this in Ireland or was this when you moved to London? So the move to London was I've probably jumped a bit here but when the band was seven years we spent on the circuit and we were going to get signed to uh, we were being signed to U2's homegrown label called Mother Records so we would have followed in the footsteps of Tuesday Blue and Hot House Flowers and we would have gone through that system and had a record out. Now, the problem was that the record they wanted to sign was one I wrote and not the lead singer. A song called Blame It On Me, which in its original Cajun form was, it was a, just a real, you know, had this real kind of, I should send you the thing because it's just, it's just youthful, like punching the air stuff. So they heard this thing and they thought, Christ, the, the guitar player is the, really the star. We'll sign him. And it was like, you can't do that. you got to sign the band. Oh, wow. It was one of those deals. We want his song, not that one. So put a proper rift down the middle of the band. So then when we came to London, that was the worst pressure possible. My manager, who was, I didn't realize he was gay. He made a pass at Larry Mullen at a party. And Larry Mullen, the drummer, decked him. And that was the end of our career with you too. Wow. Yeah. So I found out about this stuff. He didn't tell us that. I just was told the deal went cold. Okay. When did you find that then? Was that like years later? Uh, years later, when I was actually in Dream, I, I got word back that this thing happened. I mean, obviously, at that stage, I didn't give a damn because I was running way too fast. But anyway, the deal went cold and I ended up sleeping on friends' floors. And that's when I met a woman called Raina Victoria Shine. She was uh, Van Gellis's engineer. She was one of only two female engineers in all of UK at the time. And she ended up working for Jazz Summer's Big Life label. And she was the youth and Misha Paris and Soul to Soul. And she was mixing all these wonderful, you know, modern, trendy records. And she put me up on her floor and helped me get the equipment together and helped me learn it, basically. How was it for you arriving in London? Was it just like, oh, my God? Yeah, no, you know, London's a mind, mind fuck, isn't it? It's complete, you know, overwhelming. Especially when you've no money, the place is very close to you when you've got no money. You know, I, was, I had to walk everywhere. I couldn't afford buses. I didn't even have a push bike. It was it was tough, man. But as I said, I did the deal with the devil. I was going to stay at this until I just found my way. And luckily, I found people who believed in me, heard what I was doing, and and gave me a hand. You know, I, I one of the new songs on the new album is called Many Hands, and we only get to where we are in life by the good grace of, of others. So that's what that is an homage to people like Raina who put me up and. And it was interesting because once you got a reputation for, for making records, I got interfaced into other bands. So I ended up working with people like Honey Child. I don't know if you remember them. So I got you know engineering work from them. I helped them build a studio. And then I started going out to clubs and, and I heard this new sound. I was really interested in sort of Happy Mondays and, you know, Stone Roses. And who was the other? I heard KLF on the radio. And then you heard, started hearing Snap and stuff like that. I was going, God almighty, the groove. Unbelievable. So I just got obsessed by programming, getting grooves together. So coming from a guitar background, I went into production background. And then so I started working on, a, a, well, my earliest version of You're the Best Thing. And um, I went to a, a particular nightclub in, in town called, um, it wasn't Woody's, I was at the Barman in Woody's. This was called the Brain Club. Now, you know, in his, music history, you've got, if you look at Spandau Ballet and Culture Club, they, they were at the, the, the Blitz Club, right? So there's a pill, there's a backbeat, there's a look. These things, they're all together, right? It, it must be going on even times I don't even know, you know, back to the 20s and the flappers and all this sort of stuff. So yeah, I could tell that we, where we went to in this, this club in particular, it was exactly that. The boys were calling themselves psychedelic skinheads. They'd all got buzz cuts because one of them was an ex-squatty. Everyone was taking E, so everyone was loved up. We had, a, we had three-piece suits on and DM boots and the girls were wearing Vivian Westwood corsets and tutus and DM boots. And we were just dancing the shit to left field, underworld, M people, ourselves. And it, I was in this other world. I'd gone from beer and guitars and, and mainly boys in gratty places like the Mean Fiddler, right? To going to like really slick nightclubs where the grooves were smooth and there was more girls than there were boys. And I was in like musical heaven. This was brilliant. You know, it's just all 
a really heady mix so quite quite a transition to make from making sort of rock like indie rock music right into making sort of soulful house records it is but that's interesting you say because it's almost like two parallel worlds but you mentioned bands like happy mondays and stone roses which had this kind of almost psychedelic segue yeah it, it's that middle ground yeah they, they happily um well if you listen to our third album uh in memory of i managed to fuse all of my guitar influences you know, doing octaves and stuff into guitars and layering and stuff into into dance. It's probably my best dovetail effort at those things. I even have one song called Sleepyhead where I, I just took the Beatles basically and I forced it into a disco record. So I just, because I could. <laughs> and for someone who's like just loving the creative process of music, was that almost a challenge for you? When you think about creativity, what I was frustrating about early programming was, you know, setting up the, the, the floppy disk going in, the time it took for that to load, you go make a cup of tea. It was even a cup of tea used to be the little logo on your Atari mouse, or sometimes it turned into a B. And, and every time you're loading up the S950, it was like, oh, Christ, I'm doing a time stretch. I've got 20 minutes. What am I going to do? So that, that was that kind of time. And what's happening is now the distance between an idea I have and realizing it is infinitesimally small. I mean, one record we did on the new album called Make Love Cool Again, from actually uttering the first line, let's make love cool again, to actually finishing it took four days before it was mastered. The distance between the idea now and realization is infinitesimally small. I just love that. The technology is getting such now that it's so good, so reliable. I've got Arturia soft synths. They're beautifully modeled. And I have the whole 10-year uh, package. And I've got Native Instruments, the 13 Ultimate, or 14, I can't remember which one we're on now, but they're incredible. Uh, and so even just knowing those, along with the Logic ones, plus some of my, I have a 50 gig sample library of all the classic drum machines I've ever done. I can put my hands on these things in instance, and I can sort of, oh, I fancy a bit of in the air tonight drum machine. I can just go and grab that, put that in. I fancy this now needs something that's like, you know, a bit of sort of Van Halen lead. I can stick that in on Native Instruments. You, you can really do this. So if you go and listen to uh, Universal Mother on the last album, I just rocked out on the lead break. And um, I was thinking of doing something sort of a little bit Pink Floyd and a little bit Talk Talk, you know, in the color of spring, the tune I called, I don't believe in you. You want to hear the lead break on that? I think they sampled it and that's how they get that sound. And I did exactly the same with this lead break. So I not, not only just played the hell out of it to get it in there, but then I'm using Logic's DJ effects to chop the shit out of it. So it's nothing you can get on a pedal and it's a really fucked up lead break, but it just works, you know. Do you remember much about the night you and your future d partner, Alan McKenzie, met? Was you aware of him as a DJ? Yes. Yes, I was. So I went to this place called The Brain and he had a residency there. I managed to get introduced to him because I was telling anyone who would listen that I'm trying to make house records, but I can't make them sound like they do in this club. So he said, um, I'll, I'll come over and have a listen. So we were talking at the bar and then he, we were arranged to meet later on. And he came around to my flat. He brought um, a whole pack of jammy Dodgers and um, a couple of spliffs. And I, I don't, I, at this time, I've never taken drugs at this stage. And I, I didn't even have any that night. So he smoked this thing and he had the munchies and he ate the whole packet of Jammy Dodgers. Right? And he stayed for like three, four hours. And the, the track I had on the board was, um, you know, the best thing. And the first thing he said to me was, right, he tightened up the beats and he got the hi-hats working the way he wanted them. But he said, make that, make that now last for 16 bars. And I went, who the hell's going to listen to 16 bars of drums? I mean, it's just like watching paint dry. He's going, it's not for you, you dummy. This is for... DJ so they can lock on at the start of the track and cross over from the other track into ours. And I was going, mind blowing. That's the moment. I was going, this has got to really work, you know, because he had that dance floor knowledge. And up until that point, I didn't either have the kudos or the knowledge, but I had the mel melody, I had the structure, I had the, the lyrics, all the song, I, all that stuff, and, and the musicality. And that's what a lot of DJs didn't have. So it was a perfect match for us. It was, again, it's like a meeting of two worlds again. like a meeting of two worlds. And, and the thing is, um, when, when I went into that, it was, it was like the eunuch and the harem. I was, you know, they know how it's done, they know where it's done, but they can't do it themselves. I basically hadn't had mine cut off. I knew what I was doing. <laughs> so all these people in the early house music scene, a lot of them had no musical knowledge whatsoever. One of the reasons why Sasha was as successful as he was is because he's classically trained pianist. So he could mix things in the right key. He knew about his tempo and song feel. So people who had that edge from a musical background had an edge over others who were just interested in the beats. So that's what happened, that, that, that meeting myself and Alan. And then we went on and we did all sorts of things for other people. We remixed Debbie Harry, EMF, Duran Duran, Shaw Twins, Baby June, Black Girl Rock, all sorts of bands. And these were all hits, club, major club hits. 
And we were just, we had our finger on the pulse for about two years before the sound changed. Did you guys seek out a record deal for Dream or was people hearing everything you was working on? Well, how they were hearing is because we were pressing up vinyl. So we had our own label called FXU, FXU. And um, so we, when we pressed our original run, we did something like 2,000, we sold those. And then we went to 20,000. I went down to Black Market Records with five on my push bike. And the next week he wanted 20 and that went on and on. I went to Rough Trade. Just literally, first time in my life, instead of going through the filter of the music industry, I'd literally gone to a shop and people were buying these things because they were getting to hear it. Alan's partners and friends were playing our records, so they had test pressing. So he played them, Sean Johnson, Rad Rice, they all wanted a copy. So it was like a word of mouth thing, a proper viral thing. And it was just really exciting because it's the first time I saw I had cash in my hand from going to a record shop, not the other way around, but you're handing it to the guy over the counter. And it's totally different feeling. You, you felt there's something going on. Then we had a, an ID pieced on us and then the face did something and then DJ and then mix mag. And then the next thing I know, when Sasha delivered his mix of best thing, Pete Tong made it essential tune. And the next week we did our remix and he said it was so good. He's going to make it essential tune two weeks in a row. Next thing I know, I go from doing PAs in nightclubs for hundred quid. It went to 500 quid. Then it went to 2000. And the next thing I know, it's like, I've got wads of cash sitting beside me, you know, in my bedroom, waking up in the morning. And I wish it had been the time of the phone, you know, and the camera and, and the internet that I have more of a record of all these things. But it was just really heady. I was doing three and four shows a night, just going to the club dropping on the back and track singing the song putting up the logo and saying thank you good night and you could hit three or four clubs in a night that way how was it for you stepping up to the frontman role though was you comfortable in that position well initially no because I, what i was trying to do when, when alan and i met i thought look this is really clever no one knows what the club thing is a lot of these bands have names and songs but no one knows who they look like so like jazzy b was an umbrella organization a soul to soul was a, a sound system and so so with the klf so they'd have various singers in And that's what we did. We auditioned quite a few girls to see if they could, because I I wanted uh, sort of girly vocals to do that kind of, um, everybody's free, you know, the Rosala vibe, that stuff that was just, and and, and people had a small vibe. But what was happening is that the the choruses were sounding good, especially in Best Thing, but no one was nailing the verses. So the the producer pulled up my vocal and then switched over. Just your guide vocal kind of thing. That's it, yeah. And he said, "This this is where we should be going. So I ended up performing that. And then I was going, do you know what? There's only me. I've got to step up the plate. I'll jump into this. And and I dropped my guitar then. There was no... What I realized, when you've got a guitar in front of you and then you've a mic and a stand and you've got the dance of the foot pedals, right? Your occupation is a very, very small world, right? You've got six square feet if you're lucky. When you ditch all of the gear and you've got a handheld mic, you can run to the left and the right of the stage. You can look people in the eye and if they're not feeling it, you can bring them on and give them a cheeky smile. And it's very different. You can really work a crowd up. So maybe I've got a theory here that the, well, the reason why you two are as big as they are is because those guys can reach out to people at the front. That doesn't count for the Foo Fighters. So anyway, but uh, you know, this is one of those things. So, so I felt quite liberated. So I wasn't concentrating on the guitar or freaking out about the sound not kicking in or maybe losing a string. And I was just concentrating on, on, on being the lead guy. And, and, you know, it was very, very liberating. And um, yeah, I'm kind of glad I did. But we did a show this weekend in uh, Manchester uh, up in Erlam. Erlam Live, and uh, they've been trying to put this show on for two years now, and it finally went ahead. And uh, there's 5,000 people there. Everyone's so up for it now after two years of lockdown. And uh, they went nuts for us. We come on about eight o'clock, played for half an hour or so. And then Sophie Ellis Bexter was on. But I was just thinking, like, I was on that stage going, I want to have my guitar here for this one. And the next time I'm going to bring up some percussion and play that. I'm not happy with just jumping around on the stage. I want to do more. So now I'm talking about bringing more live elements back into it, more percussion. I certainly want to get the guitar involved again because I can play the hell out of that kind of Nile Rogers licks. I'm really good at those things, you know, and just get it nice and sharp and then play it in while I'm singing because I can do both. It's not a problem. I'm really looking forward to doing that. It's a bit more of a challenge. And it, I've been lazy in that regard and not really using those instruments because we can have fun with it, you know? Definitely, definitely. And uh, once you hit the top of the charts, things can only get better. It, it would go on to have a life of its own. I think you've said that song is no longer yours anymore. Uh, I guess it would be hard to imagine that when writing that song, it would go on to have the life it said. Absolutely. And why do we write? You know, writers, why do we perform? Performers and writers are ultimately looking for attention. They're also looking to entertain. All of that comes into play. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you know, thank God for people pleasing or we wouldn't have Queen and we wouldn't have the Smiths. And you know what I'm saying? Or it's just what it's about. It sort of seems to motivate us. And I was always pushing and searching for something that would just, you know, just grab people's attention 
question and not let them go, <laughs> you know, grab them to the scrawn of the neck and, and, and get into their heads and stay there. And I've been writing, by the time I started to Dream in 1990, I'd probably written about 300 songs. And what I mean by songs is verse, bridge and chorus or verse, pre and chorus. And you know why I don't call it pre-chorus? Because if you're standing on stage, you say, take it to the pre-chorus. <laughs> There's a 50-50 fucking chance if you're going to get a chorus or the bridge. It's called a bridge. A lot of Americans, Greek chorus. And um, so I was standing there. I'm thinking to myself, I want something that's really going to grab people's attention. And, you know, I've written 300 songs by that stage. And when Alan and I were working on these backing tracks, that one came into my head. I've been teaching songwriting as well. Uh, I've been lecturing in it for about five or six years at a friend's college in London. And I call it the mindfulness of songwriting. So you're always switched on to words, phrases, whatever. And I, I was uh, working in a really boring office. And uh, the girl sitting in front of me was really sympathetic one day when there was a bit of an argument in the kind of open plan office. And she saw how crestfallen I was. And she turned around, and she was doing her work. And she said, Pete, you know what they say? Things can only get better. And I was like, it wasn't a smartphone then. It was a Walkman, right? So I ran in straight into the the toilet. I was like, he's going to go got it straight in my head, what I was looking for. And that was the chorus. And I had it in my hand, took it to my writing partner that weekend. And we put it into this song that we had. But guess what? The original song sounded like Sympathy for the Devil. Okay. So it was like, ding, 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 You can walk my path. You can wear my shoes. Got it? Say, can only get better, right? Had that vibe. Did you ever record a version in that kind of format? I've got it on tape somewhere, right? And then the thing is, you leave it because that band didn't work. They were called Jordan. And two years later, I'm sitting in the thing, and Alan and I, got, we've got this sort of Dieter Mayer thing. Alan gets up and he's going, what the fuck's that? I was going, it's this song. <laughs> Fuck it out. So it's like a, 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 you know, a revelation moment. And we, we took it to the nightclub that weekend and we had it on DAF and we played it out. And the boys took the tops off and had their hands in there. We're like, this is the piano intro. And we just knew. <laughs> Just you. That's amazing. Yeah, just going to light up. And it just did. It did the whole thing. It's just like it's still been a calling card for us ever since. Wonderful, man. Wonderful. It seems like you've almost worked within like a DIY ethic all the way through your career. I think your first release with Ty the Boy was done independently. That's right. You said like the initial stuff with D-Ream, you was pressing up your old... We had our own label. That's right. And even now today with like your new material on the new album, Open Hearts, Open Minds, you still work a lot in-house and have creative control. Yeah. That's like a pretty full circle thing which you've got i'm trying to encourage all artists to own their artistry and their work i've had major success by going with majors they own the hype they have a hundred grand marketing spend on a single if that's what you need then that's what you do but i gave that stuff away it no longer belongs to me i earn money from it but they do what they want with it pretty much right Whereas this stuff it's like we made the whole album from start to finish with no interference no one saying do this do that they used to come into the studio and we had a thing called the A&R Theater. So it was marked as vocal, lead vocal, but it was doing fuck all. So every time they'd all come in going, it's just not loud enough, mate. You got to make it. Okay, then that's the thing. You put that to where you think that's right. And they'd come in and they go, that's it. And we go, Jesus, he's brilliant. Listen to what he's done. It's a dead fader, right? The guy's rocked it. He's made the record. The A&R fader. There you go. You've got that direct contact with your audience now as well, which is another bonus. If you think about it, hopefully what bands should be able to do is, yes, if you've got to use Spotify to, to announce your work, you've got to drive people to your website. You can stream from your own website. You've got direct connection to your fans. That's the only relationship that matters. The rest of it is just piffle. It's waffle and it's hype and it's not real. What is real is at the weekend, there was about 20, 30 people at the front row at the barriers who'd been waiting all night who sang all of the new stuff word for word, never mind the old stuff. That might, I can't tell you that is, that's that's the circle <laughs> just, just just right there. That's what it's all about. And they made our night and we made their night and that's that's what it's about, you know? That's it. people pleasing, but entertainment and pinch me, man. <laughs> pinch me. I do this for a living.
big thank you to Pete Connor of Dream for taking some time and sharing his journey with me here on the Straight to Video podcast. I really enjoyed chatting with him and I'm sure he's got a lot more stories to tell of his time both before and during the time in the chart topping band. So maybe if things work out, I can get him back on and learn a little more because that will be a lot of fun. In the meantime, though, if you enjoyed our chat, please check out d-ream.co.uk for more news on their new single and album and look out for some live shows soon. And please be sure to like, follow or subscribe to this show wherever you listen to podcasts or alternatively, you can find them all over at stvpod.com along with some straight to video music, videos and merch. And speaking of music, the new straight to video Halloween song Trick or Treat, which was originally recorded by Fastway from the 1986 horror movie of the same name, will be released on October the 1st. Patrons on the Straight to Video Patreon page will get an early listen and download, so if you'd like to be part of that, please check out patreon.com forward slash stvpod for that and a bunch of other cool stuff. In the meantime, though, I really appreciate all the shares, comments, and continued interest and support of this show. I'm having a lot of fun doing it, and to know you guys all come back to listen to these talks really means a lot. So until we do it again, take care and speak to you all real soon. (laughs) 